orators are joining us from Walmart Labs. Arun George comes with 20 plus years of experience and is currently working as the Director, Software Engineering at Walmart Global Tech. He leads a team of technical consultants, CRMs and program managers for orchestrating Walmart's application cloud native journey. Arun will be leading today's session with his colleague, Mr. Praveen Kulkarni, who, as a director, software engineering at Walmart, comes with 20 years of experience and is responsible for setting up the engineering and DevOps teams at Walmart. In their power pack talk today, they both shall share the golden nuggets of insights on how Walmart Global Tech is efficiently executing chaos engineering across all its digital solutions. We are very happy to bring to you Mr. Arun George and Mr. Praveen Kulkarni. Lighting up your screens right now. Hello, everyone. Uh, very good morning, good evening to uh, wherever you are located. Uh, my name is Praveen Kulkarni and uh, I work as a director of software engineering for Walmart Global Tech. And uh, I basically take care of multiple functions within Walmart for this topic. To set the context, I lead the SRE and uh, the performance engineering function. And in today's session, me and my colleague, uh, we're going to be talking about chaos engineering, the way it is done in uh, Walmart. Arun, uh, would you want to go ahead uh, with your introduction? Hello, all. welcome all of you to the session on chaos engineering within Walmart Global Tech. My name is Arun George. I'm a director of engineering for the tech platforms area within Walmart Global Tech. I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with chaos engineering, but I'm not that sure whether all of you know about Walmart that well. So let me begin with that. Walmart is world's number one company in terms of revenue. We have been the Fortune One company for the last 10 years and just missed to be on that top spot only a couple of times in the last 20 years. Uh, Walmart has been in the retail business for more than 60 years now. Walmart has around uh, 5,500 retail stores in the U.S. and almost the same number of stores internationally. Most of the U.S. stores are gigantic super centers with an area of 200,000 square feet and more. Walmart has 10 big e-commerce brands around the world, Walmart.com in the U.S. being the most important one. Walmart has relied on technology to make it the world's largest retailer. We are known to adopt the latest information technology throughout our history. Our software systems control various store systems like the POS system, IoT devices in the store, all the supply chain, logistics, and warehouse management systems employed throughout our network. We also build and operate complex e-commerce websites. Stores and e-commerce work in tandem and fulfill each other's needs. Now, you might be wondering why I'm talking about all of these details in this session. This is just to give you an idea about the scale of transactions, the size of data, and the complexity of our applications. Considering the scale of operations, it is imperative to think about something like chaos engineering. We'll explain about that in a bit. At this point, I would like to introduce my colleague, Mr. Praveen Kulkarni, who is the Director of Engineering within Tech Platforms Area again. He is a resident expert on chaos engineering and building resilient systems in general. Uh, again, just to give you a little bit of how it's done within Walmart. Global Tech Platforms is a centralized team within Walmart, which enables a global hybrid cloud solution for Walmart Global Tech. We own one of the largest private data center setups in the US, and we have partnerships with Azure and GCP to build a hybrid cloud ecosystem. Our software solutions are deployed across various private clouds, public clouds, and our edge locations. So it ends up being a very complex system with a lot of dependencies and interconnections. Most of the modern systems are built as microservices, but you know, then there are a number of legacy monoliths also in the mix. So these systems interact in complex ways and are dependent on each other. Even though we are the Fortune 1 company, we aren't above and beyond CAP theorem. You all know CAP theorem. We want to make, a, make sure our systems are available and are consistent as much as possible. But partition tolerance is a reality that we have to deal with. Building resilient systems is an art. We are here to talk about that now. We'll go through some of the solutions that Praveen and his team have built for Walmart and see how it might be beneficial for all of you. The solutions that they have built have helped in building resilient systems across different markets, countries, and entities of Walmart. 
Praveen, uh, do you mind explaining what are some of the factors that draw us to formalize chaos engineering discipline within Walmart? Sure, Arun. Uh, thanks for setting the context and uh, you know explaining you know the scale at which we operate. And like you said, um, you know considering all the complexities, it is uh, imperative that you know all the systems that are built in Walmart are resilient and more importantly fault tolerant. Now uh, we've talked about what chaos engineering is. I'll come to that in a bit. But before I do that, let me uh, give you a background of you know, why and uh, why we uh, ventured into this space. We all know that, you know, all uh, the various orgs have the stress testing or what's called the performance testing is part of every orgs DNA. But what is missing in many of the cases is on the resiliency discipline or the resiliency aspects of whatever is done. That is one major driving force. And the second one, like Arun, you mentioned about the uh, hybrid cloud strategy with hybrid cloud and the way the systems interact across public cloud, the private cloud, and a lot of our legacy data centers. It is very, very important that all our systems are resilient and they can withstand any turbulence that uh, can come in any time. They don't come in with notice, right? So. That is the background. And with that, let me uh, spend uh, some time on explaining, you know, what we consider as chaos engineering. So the simple definition is uh, chaos engineering is a discipline which subjects any system to failure conditions and it will help seek answers to questions like uh, what's the impact to the overall system and its consumers if it were uh, to go through any fault conditions or chaos conditions. And the other question is, how quickly can it recover when the failure or the chaos uh, condition ceases? So that's also an equally important aspect, right? Of course, there are other aspects to how you can look at chaos engineering. But in terms of the objectives that we went after achieving through the chaos engineering discipline is one, how the systems can fast fail and fail gracefully. And that is super important considering that, you know, the, we'll have to contain the blast radius of any chaos conditions that a system can potentially go through. And the third objective is how can the system recover without any manual intervention if the chaos condition were to go away. And the fourth one is when a chaos, when a system is subjected or is undergoing a chaos condition, we have to make sure that the other system functionality is not impacted. If the system is going through one chaos in one specific area, it doesn't mean that the whole system needs to stop functioning, right? So that is an important aspect. And all of these objectives put together help us in being very aggressive towards the overall mean time to recover. So considering that, you know, in the retail space, how quickly can we recover from a given condition is what to do the overall business. And like you can see on this slide, I've listed out some very common chaos conditions. Now, this is not like a super set of everything that you can do, but some of the common chaos conditions are like, hey, uh, what happens when a downstream dependency or a service fails? or it is going through a restart, or if it is slowing down, or, you know, what happens when, you know, your container or a VM or a server were to slow down, slow down can happen for uh, multiple reasons. And the other aspects are like, you know, if you have dependency on a cache cluster, what happens when the, you know, cache uh, cluster is going through some turbulence in form of like a node suddenly goes down and triggers a rebalance or a node gets added to the cluster and that also triggers a rebalance, right? So uh, these are few examples. Of course, I'll not go into the details of everything that's uh, listed on uh, the slide here, but that gives everyone a general idea of what we mean when we say, uh, when we talk about a chaos condition. So that's a very, very high level overview of what chaos engineering means within the Walmart ecosystem. Perfect. I, th I think this is this sets a context on you know what what is chaos testing. This is very very useful. 
how about we go into something like you know what are the things that an organization should take care if they want to implement chaos testing or chaos engineering in general sure uh, i think that's a great question arun before i get into that in the walmart scenario uh, for the chaos engineering we broadly classify it into three dimensions like you can see on this slide here we deal with chaos at the platform level when we talk about a platform it could be like you know your cloud offering it could be your you know container platform it could be a bunch of vms or a you know platform as a service that is offered so that is one dimension of chaos and uh, i've listed down some of the key elements like you know the network topology the network elements within the platform you know those things can also be subjected to chaos situations and dc failover that's the most common thing like it, dc failover is usually talked about in the disaster recovery scenario right but when we talk about chaos engineering it is more than just dc failover it could be you know failover within the same uh, data center between multiple clusters or you know your whips going down it could be uh, a lot of these uh, things within the platform the second dimension is everything related to the uh, data sources now data source can be in different uh, forms like it could be your relational database it could be your cache cluster it could be your no sql or it could even be as simple as storage where you know data is persisted so uh, some of the very common uh, chaos scenarios are like you know your failing over db from primary to secondary or if the db has slowed down for some reason or you know like i talked about you know cache nodes rebalance and other things right so uh, these are some very common um, chaos situations uh, for the data sources and the third one which is you know more relevant to a lot of the uh, development community is the application resiliency now at the application level uh there are multiple ways to look at uh, you know how a chaos can happen so these are the three broad dimensions and when you talk about resiliency or chaos as a whole it could be a combination of two or more of these dimensions right but in the walmart scenario it is being tackled in three different dimensions so that is having mentioned uh, about that i'll come back to uh, the you know your original question on what are some of the typical things uh, that are part of a, a resiliency exercise now one thing i want to call out here is i'm using the term resiliency while talking about chaos now if your chaos engineering strategy is very well defined then that actually results into your systems being more resilient and that's the reason why you know i'm terming this slide as a resiliency exercise and when i say chaos strategy at the org level now this has to be very well defined in a way that you know the various teams the various entities uh, in an organization can adopt and implement so this gives you a very uniform way of defining the chaos strategy within a large org and with this it is also super important that you know we have a very well defined fast failing strategy uh, we have a readily available uh, circuit breakers that can be reused across different microservices or different uh, systems and also the other thing is like what is it that you want to achieve out of your chaos strategy so that end result is you know super important to you know have more you know beneficial results and the other aspects are like you know in terms of the design and implementation when you talk about this from a resiliency standpoint it is super important to have you know identified the dependencies for your systems and what are the slas you're dealing with now these help you define various things like your timeouts the way your circuit breakers work and uh, many other things in terms of how you are making your systems more resilient and how you are protecting your own system 
and these are all things that can be done at the code level too along with you know the design aspects and uh, the next step is more about identifying the failure scenarios and you might possibly have 100 different failure uh, scenarios for your system but it is not necessary that you have 100 solutions implemented right you know there are possibly 10 20 different failures that can be addressed with something like a circuit breaker that's one simple example and the fourth step is how well are you testing and making sure your system is resilient now for testing this out it like the failure scenarios identified you actually subject your system to those conditions and when you do that one thing that i want to call out is all of these things will have to be done at synthetic load conditions meaning you make sure that there is enough traffic coming in and then you subject the system to failure and the way the load is generated i term it like a queuing workload model which actually means that you know it is more simulating the realistic condition meaning no matter what happens to the fate of a bunch of requests coming in new requests will keep coming in no matter what happens to the fate of the other requests right so that is a more realistic scenario make sure that you simulate the synthetic traffic in that model and the last step which you know we over the years we have put together a maturity model which actually helps various teams to figure out whatever they're doing as part of the resiliency exercise is good enough or if they have to be doing more so that's the uh, maturity model i'll not go into the details of how to define that maturity model but one suggestion here is make sure that you define this that can be reused across the org and the teams can directly benefit out of this so that's a high level view of what can be done if uh, somebody is willing to go down the path of building more resilient systems perfect i think i just wanted to amplify that point that you made there that you know this shouldn't be thought of as an afterthought or this shouldn't be like you know okay you know let's think about this as a testing step that we think after everything is built and then you know we come at the end and just do it instead of that have a plan have a strategy build things right from the scratch with chaos engineering in mind with resiliency uh, as your end objective i think that's a different way of looking at the solution altogether i believe perfect so can we double click a little bit on a couple of these concepts like you know i think you talked about chaos scenarios or identifying failure conditions you know can we go deeper into that please sure arun uh, so the one thing that is super important is you know for you to be knowing what are the different ways in which you can expect your system to fail right on this slide i have a very very simple diagram to the right which actually talks about uh, a lot of things but for this discussion let us assume i own service a and my service has dependencies in systems a b and c and it also has dependencies on various data sources like i was talking about right it talks to a relational database it talks to a kafka queue it also talks to a mega a memcache cluster so considering this architecture this is a very very simple architecture now let's figure out like you know how we identify the um, chaos conditions or the failure scenarios now let's take uh, sir dependency a so what one way of identifying uh, a scenario is i slow down service dependency a and see what is the impact that my service is having so slowing down dependency a doing like a rolling restart of all the uh, nodes within dependency a or you severe the network link between service a and dependency a these are three simple chaos conditions that can happen of course there are many many other things that you can consider likewise you know when i say like hey uh, dependency a is going through some chaos conditions so some part of the functionality that i serve within my system is going to get impacted now that is to make sure that you know my other functionality that i serve within from my system they are not getting impacted like in this diagram 
I have functionality that depends on dependency B and dependency C. So I need to make sure that, you know, I ring fence or uh, have my design or implementation such a way that if the chaos in dependency A were to happen, my functionality for dependency B and C does not get impacted. So that will make sure that, you know, the blast radius of what is happening is just uh, restricted to dependency A alone. And while I'm making sure within my uh, service or my system, I'm fast failing, I my circuit breaker opens up and does all that good things that I just talked about. The same scenarios can be adopted to dependency B and C. Now, coming to the relational database, a database can slow down for various reasons. Or you might get into a situation where, you know, your relational database has to fail over from your primary to secondary. Now, those are some of the typical examples. And with a Kafka queue, what happens is like you keep posting messages into the Kafka queue. What happens if the Kafka queue were unreachable for some reason, right? What happens to your system? And likewise with the dependency on the cache cluster, um, there are multiple uh, scenarios like I will take a cache node out of the cluster that will trigger a rebalance or I add a cache node into the cluster that also triggers a rebalance. Now, when rebalancing happens, a lot of system resources go into fetching data and copying it from one place A to place B, right? And that also depends on the replication factors that you set within your cache cluster. So these are some of the very, very common, um, you know, chaos scenarios. And this is one way of tackling and identifying what are the different chaos conditions that your system can suffer. And of course, with all this, the end goal is the upstream client or your consumers don't have to wait for too long to hear back from you. And that purely depends on, you know, what's the fast failure mechanism you've implemented and what kind of a circuit breaker you have. So that we will make sure that the blast radius is contained within my system and it doesn't propagate elsewhere. So that is what I mean by the blast radius. So these are some of the things uh, around, uh, that we typically do and we suggest teams to be adopting this. Perfect. So to summarize, I mean, you have to understand your system, the dependencies, the components that are involved, how can they fail, in what different ways can they fail, and how do you look at addressing the different classes of failures? You may not have to go after each and every failure, but the classes of failures and how do you take precautionary measures about that? How do you design precautionary measures about that, right? Once we do that, you know, do you mind going to the next step, which is like, you know, how do we perform testing, the actual testing, you know, can you give a little bit more details about that once you identify the scenarios and you know how it is going to fail? Sure, absolutely. Now, we've done all the hard work, like we've talked about strategy, we've talked about the implementation, what needs to be done uh, as part of your design and implementation phase. I've also talked about how do you identify uh, possible failure scenarios. Now, let me go into the validation aspects of all the hard work that we have put in uh, here, right? So if you've got all the steps we've talked about until now, if you've got them right, then the next thing about how do you test and validate should be fairly straightforward. And for the sake of simplicity, if, you know, from a validation standpoint, what we do is like, you know, we define failure scenarios. Like we, I touched upon that and when you define failure scenarios, you need to be very, very sure about what is the expected behavior. Now, you slow down a database. What happens uh, or what do you expect to see when a database slows down, right? So these are very important aspects. And then the other thing is you just, the failure scenarios that you identify, you need to be very sure of how you're going to simulate or inject those failure conditions. And the next step is simulating synthetic traffic. I talked about uh, the synthetic traffic. And uh, the one thing I always tell every team uh, is when you're doing the validation, make sure that you have the right amount of traffic coming into your system. Now, if 
I've seen teams where, you know, they do some, you know, API calls through, let's say, uh, a postman job or a curl uh, command running in a loop. Now, that may not suffice or that may not give you the right kind of observations from the failure conditions or the scenario that you are executing. And the when you're simulating synthetic traffic, you need to be very sure that, you know, the metrics that you're seeing are stable. Meaning, when I talk about metrics, it could be your error rate, it could be your latency, it could be the throughput you're getting. You need to make sure that, you know, the system is behaving well before you actually go to the next step of introducing the chaos. So, the third step is where we introduce the chaos. And once we introduce the chaos, that's when the real, uh, you know, challenge is going to be. Now, you'll have to be on your toes to get your observations. When you introduce the chaos, how quickly or how uh, your system is fast failing request because your system is already experiencing some chaos. So your circuit breaker opens. How quickly is it opening up? And when you're fast failing the request, what is it that your consumers are seeing? And are they getting impacted? Are the, uh, you know, request queues piling up on your own uh, hardware? Um, what sort of an impact do you see in terms of metrics? Like, is the error rate increasing? Yes, possibly the error rate, the latencies, you know, the throughput will see some fluctuation when you introduce the chaos. But other than that, it should not be like, you know, your error rate has jumped from, you know, point one percent all the way to like 70 percent now if that happens then it's very clear that you know there's something really wrong and your system is not resilient enough how are your consumers uh getting affected like talking about blast radius you need to make sure that you know your consumers while they see that you know there is an error message friendly error message that they are receiving but they're not being made to wait forever to hear back from you, right? So that blast radius needs to be contained. And uh, the other and the most important thing is when all of these chaos conditions happen, one key takeaway will be to make sure that, you know, the appropriate alerts are getting triggered. And when I say alerts, um, I've introduced an intentional chaos. Now, is it triggering the right kind of alerts? and it could be, it has to be the right kind of alerts. And that also helps us validate a lot of things from the observability aspects of the organization, right? So that is also a key element which helps us in keeping the mean time to detect to the lowest possible number. And the last one and the most important one is you remove the chaos and then you measure how quickly you're recovering back. And the expectation is you recover without any manual intervention. I say this mainly because, you know, one common thing is like, hey, I need to restart a cluster of, you know, 2,500 instances to actually recover. Now the chaos has gone away, but my system has gone into a state where I cannot recover unless I restart. So that shouldn't be the case. So these are some of the very, very key uh, things and a very, very simple approach to the chaos testing that uh, is put together in uh, Walmart. Perfect. I th this is really useful. I think we are kind of close to the time also. So um, can I quickly ask you, what are some of the tools that uh, people can use, which are available out there in the market for these phases? Sure. Um, when we talk about chaos engineering or chaos testing, right, it is typically, uh, you know, confused to be like everything about tools. But considering all these steps, uh, you will need basically two key uh, elements or tools. One is a tool to inject your chaos and the second one to simulate the synthetic traffic. Now, to simulate synthetic traffic, you have tons and tons of options in the open source world or you also have paid uh, vendor solutions uh, that are typically used in your performance testing. And from a chaos standpoint, there are open source offerings like you know your chaos star which i call uh, it's like the chaos monkey the chaos gorilla and we also have uh, the chaos blade and these are all open source offerings 
and uh, these are some of the very important things that you would need uh, from a tool standpoint perfect and just to reiterate your point again you know it's not about getting a tool from the market and just blindly applying it it's more about knowing your system very well how the system should behave what are the expectations how should it handle the load how should it handle slowness all, all of those things right i mean you need a deeper understanding of the system exactly perfect. uh with your long years of working on these solutions for walmart you know can you just talk about some of the key wins that you had uh from walmart point of view uh sure yeah i think uh, you know there are multiple things that i can go on and on uh, for you know hours together but uh, you know in the interest of time i just want to highlight some of the key wins that we've had across the organization that are listed on the slide here um the a structured chaos engineering approach has helped us identify areas where service failover was taking longer than anticipated and uh, you know a large chunk of you know application the container sizing the vm sizing you know while it is all done keeping in mind the you know performance or the scalability aspects but from a chaos standpoint if it were to go through turbulence what kind of a you know hardware sizing you will need so all of that uh, were completely streamlined and uh, like i was mentioning about the timeouts uh, it the whole chaos engineering approach helped us streamline the way you know scientific timeouts were arrived at across various systems across various services and we were also able to identify key areas where circuit breaker is absolutely essential there are areas where you can do without circuit breakers but you know this whole structured approach helped us identify what are the key areas where you absolutely need something like a circuit breaker and uh, you know it also helped us identify uh, you know the threads being held like you know the system resources being held for much longer than anticipated and uh, like i touched upon in the last slide missing alerts when uh, chaos is injected when the chaos is being experienced within a system you know you expect to see the right kind of alerts so you know quickly what's happening right so those are some of the key wins that we have had uh, across the organization there are multiple perfect. things that like i said you can go on forever perfect i'm not seeing many kpis and time savings and you know things like that that typically gets listed i'm very happy to observe that you know these are all systemic improvements that uh, are spanning across multiple systems and you know the holistic improvements perfect i i think we are close to the time so uh, do you mind uh, sharing some of the key takeaways that people can you know or, or with your experience what do you think people should take away from this session yeah uh, sure arun uh, i want to leave the audience with uh, some of the key learnings that i have had uh, in the years that i've spent doing kiosk engineering and some of these are listed on the slide here uh, i'll quickly go through them the first and the foremost thing is a mind frame change except that you know every system that you build can fail only then you know you can make your system more and more resilient and like you know we were we touched upon it a little bit earlier um, chaos engineering is not about only chaos testing and it is not about a tool that will help you bring in chaos engineering discipline it is more than that and chaos validation should happen at load conditions only when i say load conditions it is like you have the right kind of traffic coming in the synthetic traffic like i talked about and fast failing like uh, you know most of us know what it is is not equal to having aggressive timeouts now uh, aggressive timeouts cannot replace the need for you to have you know uh, the fast failure or the defensive mechanism and last but not the least resiliency needs to be built into the system from the initial stage as early as you know the requirements and the design and implementation so these are some of the key learnings i've had over the years that i've spent on kios engineering perfect that was uh, really insightful i uh, thank you pravin for condensing your experience and wisdom into few key bullet points and action items I i'm sure the audience would have got a glimpse of what uh, kios engineering is all about and how it get uh, done in in a larger organization the way uh, you, you and your teams have set up these practices within global tech platforms uh, and also you know in general in walmart global tech has helped a lot in building resilient systems for our customers with that uh, it's a wrap from our end thank you for attending 
we hope this was useful for you thank you all thank you everyone